is pre-exhaustion superior to traditional strength training? Let's take a look at a new study. Hey everybody, welcome back to my channel and today we're diving into a new study that puts a classic training method known as pre-exhaustion under the microscope. It's been used by gym goers for decades but rarely has it been tested in long-term, well-controlled training studies. You've probably seen it or even used it yourself and the idea being that you pre-fatigue a muscle with an isolation movement before hitting it again with a compound lift. It's most commonly used in hypertrophy-focused or muscle building training programs but the question we all want to know is does it actually enhance muscle growth or performance or are we just creating fatigue and reaching failure in a different way this new eight-week study which is currently a preprint meaning it's not gone through the peer review process yet and it's still subject to revisions set out to directly compare pre-exhaustion training to traditional straight set training in a group of trained lifters so let's unpack what they found, what it means for your training, and whether this technique is really worth using. Pre-exhaustion was first popularized by a gentleman by the name of Arthur Jones back in the 1970s, and it's still found in many bodybuilding textbooks today. The idea is to perform a single joint exercise like a leg extension or a hamstring curl to fatigue a specific muscle group before moving on to a compound multi-joint movement like a squat so that the target muscle gets pushed harder in the big lift. Or perhaps a different way of looking at this is the muscle gets a more targeted fatiguing stimulus by the time you complete the compound lift. And in theory, this could stimulate more growth. Now, most of the research on pre-exhaustion has been acute and uses indirect measuring tools like EMG to assess muscle activity in a single resistance training session. And only two prior studies have tested pre-exhaustion longitudinally and both used untrained individuals or very different training protocols. This study is the first of its kind to apply a full eight multi-set supervised resistance training program comparing pre-exhaustion to traditional training methods in resistance trained individuals. Yay! So what was the purpose of this study? The researchers aimed to determine whether pre-exhaustion training leads to greater improvements in muscle hypertrophy, strength, muscular endurance, and body composition compared to traditional straight set training. The researchers hypothesized that both methods would be similarly effective for muscle size and power gains, but that pre-exhaustion might produce better improvements in muscular endurance, while traditional training would be superior for pure strength adaptations. So let's take a look at the methods. What did they do? 48 resistance trained participants were randomly assigned to either a traditional training group or a pre-exhaustion group for eight weeks. Both groups trained their lower body muscles twice a week using the exact same exercises, the leg extension, the Smith machine squats, the seated hamstring curl and Romanian deadlifts. Each group performed four sets of exercise in an eight to 12 rep range, training to momentary failure. The key difference between the two protocols was the order and structure. For example, the traditional group performed all sets of an exercise before moving to the next, resting for about two minutes between sets. The pre-exhaustion group, on the other hand, performed a single joint isolation exercise, which was then immediately followed by the related compound movement. For example, the leg extension was performed immediately before the squats, with minimal rest between, forming basically a superset. Muscle hypertrophy was assessed using ultrasound imaging at multiple sites along the quadriceps and hamstrings. Specifically, the measurements were taken at 50 and 70% of the femur length for the rectus femoris and the vastus lateralis, and at 50% of the femur length for the biceps femoris and semitendinosus. These sites represent both the mid and distal regions of the muscle and are commonly used to track regional muscle growth. Strength was evaluated by testing each participant's one rep max on the Smith machine squat. Power, on the other hand, was assessed using the counter movement jump. Muscular endurance was measured by having participants perform as many leg extension reps as possible at 60% of their body weight. Body composition was also assessed via in-body scans and both total training volume in kilograms lifted and the session RPE were tracked across the training intervention. So let's take a look at the results. Both groups saw increases in muscle thickness across all of the sites measured. 
While all the outcomes tended to favor the traditional strength training group, the differences were quite small and most of the comparisons had a fairly wide confidence interval. The pooled data showed a slight advantage for the traditional group, but it wasn't statistically strong enough to be conclusive. And interestingly, the muscle data is not actually provided in the paper. The authors provided effect sizes and posterior probabilities, but as we have all learned from reviewing hypertrophy research, seeing the magnitude of change and the differences measured in either centimeters or millimeters is really important to understanding this data and our ability to add weight to these findings. According to the preprint, the data is available in a supplementary file, which I have requested from the research Researchers. So I'll follow up with you if and when I receive it. Looking to power and strength, the participants squat one rep max improved similarly in both groups with no clear benefit to either approach. The same was true for the counter movement jump height. Both groups showed only small non-significant improvements. This suggests that pre-exhausting muscles before strength focused lifts doesn't impair long-term strength development, but on the same token, it doesn't enhance it either. Looking to muscular endurance, interestingly, muscular endurance also improved equally in both groups. And this contradicts the initial hypothesis that pre-exhaustion would drive more endurance gains due to greater local fatigue. Now, it's possible that the higher volume loads accumulated by the traditional group actually helped offset this. Or it's also possible that the two training methods were just too similar to render any differences in muscular endurance. And looking to body composition, body fat percentage decreased more in the traditional group compared to the pre-exhaustion group. And fat-free mass gains also tended to slightly favor the traditional group. Again, the evidence wasn't overwhelmingly strong, but it leans towards a marginal advantage for traditional training on body composition metrics. Now, to the author's own admission, both interventions likely produced negligible to small changes in body composition. So these changes should be interpreted this way. Now looking to volume load and rate of perceived exertion. The traditional group lifted about 30% more total volume over the eight weeks. In contrast, the pre-exhaustion sessions were completed 36% faster, but participants reported the sessions feeling harder. In fact, the reported session RPE was almost a full point higher on average for the pre-exhaustion group. So what does this all mean for you and I? Well, if you're training for hypertrophy, strength, or body composition, traditional set training and pre-exhaustion training seem to both work effectively. So despite what you hear people say, pre-exhaustion doesn't seem to add any unique advantage. The authors point out that pre-exhaustion may blunt volume load over time, which could affect gains. But let's be real, all advanced training techniques, whether it's BFR, drop sets, or pause reps, they all mess with rest and fatigue and typically decrease the volume necessary to reach failure. So if you view volume as the be all end all for muscle growth adaptations, then you might view that as negative. But on the positive side, pre-exhaustion training does appear to produce meaningful training adaptations while cutting down training time. So it might be a valuable tool along with a myriad of other training techniques for people like myself with tight training schedules or as a means to add variety to your training program. Just know that it will likely feel harder and it may reduce the total load that you can lift if you are somebody that's concerned with your maximal training loads. So what are some main takeaways here? Well, this study shows that pre-exhaustion training can be a time efficient strategy and still deliver equal muscle and strength gains. Some might say that if you're trying to optimize hypertrophy, traditional set structures likely offer a small edge. However, I'd still need to see that muscle data to know just how compelling this claim really is. Now, for those of you who have read my book, The Complete Exercise Guide to Muscle Hypertrophy, I review several, quote, fancy training methods or advanced training techniques in chapter eight, much like those techniques studied in today's paper. Overall, I concluded that almost every fancy training method or technique, like drop set training or rest pause approaches, will modify the training load or a metabolic aspect of the training program to help lifters reach failure in a slightly different way. 
For example, blood flow restriction prevents recovery during rest periods, which helps you reach failure more quickly. In a similar fashion, pre-fatigue re-fatigues the muscle before the compound movement, which can help the lifter reach failure more quickly on the compound lift. And since the end point is still sufficient muscle activation and fatigue, it seems reasonable to assume that all of these training methods lead to similar muscle growth over time. The same way I look at all of the different dietary approaches out there in that any dietary approach that can create a calorie deficit has the potential for achieving fat loss. So to wrap things up, this study suggests that pre-exhaustion training isn't necessarily better or worse than traditional straight set training, but it may come with a few trade-offs. It can save time and still deliver meaningful results, but it might reduce your total training volume if you care about maximum strength and volume load, and it might feel harder for the lifter as well, which could impact your progress over time. Traditional training might offer a slight edge in terms of muscle growth, especially when volume load is a priority, but it seems unlikely that muscle growth was meaningfully different in the study under review today. Now, as I always say, the best training style is the one that you can do consistently with a high degree of effort and in a way that supports your goals. Now, let me know in the comments if you've ever used pre-exhaustion in your own training. Thank you so much for watching this video, guys. And if you found this breakdown helpful, please hit that like button, subscribe to my channel for more science-based training and nutrition content, and I'll see you in my next video.